So good morning, everyone. This is the third day of the Open GovCon. So Kyle, he's going to be a little bit late, so I'm just going to be representing Kyle <laughs> as Kyle 2.0. <laughs> I'm Hassan Yassar, and working for Carnegie Mellon University. I'm a technical director and faculty member as well. And our first speaker is Clyde Spurset, and he's going to talk about acquiring, retaining great government tech talent. And Clyde, the floor is yours, and we're going to happy to hear your context. Yep, thank you. All right. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so, my name is Clyde C. Passat. I head up the training and certification group for the foundation, uh, which we created about 10 years ago because we realized that there was this weird behavior in open source where people didn't like to write training material and just expected other people to pick it up because that's what README files are for. And of course, that's not how anybody learns software. And so, uh, one of the things that happens in the market is when open source gets widely adopted, you don't necessarily get this rich ecosystem coming from the commercial providers uh, to onboard people into it because what they want to onboard you into is their product version of that. But if you're brand new, it's pretty helpful to start with the basics and understand well, what is a Linux distribution or a Kubernetes cluster before you get into the AWS version or to the Azure version. And so as a foundation, we created the training group to focus pretty specifically on training and certification programs that create entry-level talent in the open source pro uh, projects that drive whole sectors of the tech economy. Uh, and having spent a decade sort of looking at that, there's, you know, there's been lots of different trends sort of up and down. The, the one thing that has remained true is you very rarely find an organization or a sector where they're satisfied with their ability to access talent. And as somebody who used to work in the government sector before I switched over, I dare say that very few of you are probably satisfied with the level of access to talent or your ability to retain that talent uh, as you develop it. All the while, the expectations keep rising, right? Of why aren't we doing more? You know, how can we get more secure? What are we doing about this generative AI stuff? And so it does feel like a pretty high hill to climb when you are. Uh, battling to find talent, struggling with pay skills, struggling with attrition, because some startup with a giant stock option program just came wandering down the cor corridor telling your people. And so there are some unique challenges uh, in the public sector that uh, exacerbate stuff that's already happening in uh, other parts of the economy. Uh, I only have a couple of slides, and as a mic here, so if anybody wants to ask questions, just you know, raise your hand, we'll get you the mic. I think there are quite a few folks watching online. So uh, I'll try to get the mic to you so that you can, uh, the folks who are remote can hear the question before we start the discussion. Um, but feel free to weigh in anytime. This is, uh, goes a lot better if there are observations from you all, because I'm going to posit a few things that sort of seem generally true when you think about public sector and DOD type um, organizations. Um, but of course, you guys are the ones living it, right? So it'd be great to get your perspective on you know, what's life really like kind of at the cool face. Um, you know, one thing that's really interesting, if I think about it from the perspective of new talent on the outside sort of looking into the market, is if all you did was read the headlines, you would think that this is the worst time in history to consider starting a tech career. Because literally every day, you pop it open, and it's 10,000 more laid off at this company in round three of layoffs, and 5,000 more laid off. And that's true, right? I mean, there's clearly been a lot of layoffs, particularly from the larger tech organizations. You have to remember, those were also the organizations that just went on an unprecedented hiring binge kind of post-COVID, right? And so there's, you know, eventually things return to the mean, but from a uh, naive users perspective, and we're going to spend quite a, some more time talking about new talent in the market, right? The people who aren't currently in the market, aren't currently practitioners, but are good candidates for bringing in and onboarding in. Uh, and their view is, uh, this is a terrible environment, layoffs everywhere. You know, I'm going to go be an influencer because that seems like a thing that makes a lot of money. Um, but if you look at the data, and I think there's some cards on the seat for the 23, 2023 State of Tech Talent Jobs Report. This is research we just got done. We published it this week. 
And we kind of went underneath the headlines to ask, well, what's really happening? Right? We know what the headlines say is happening. And two interesting things happened when we look at the data. One is we, we saw that almost half, this tiny number at the bottom says 45% of the job cuts, were in fairly senior positions, which was quite unusual compared to past downturns. You know, a lot of highly compensated director and above folks uh, got impacted. Um, now, most of them, it turns out, are finding <laughs> work fairly quickly post that because they're senior and they're typically finding work in organizations a little bit smaller than the one they were at before. But the, the, most of the adjustments were skewed heavily towards the more expensive resources. And at the same time, in the same survey, organizations said that they planned to continue hiring in the focused areas. And not surprisingly, that's things like cloud technologies, like cybersecurity, like AI. And so it's a little bit schizophrenic, right? You're laying off all these senior people on one hand, and at the same time, you're saying, I need to get all this other talent on the other hand. And how does that work? So how do you square the circle? And part of what's happening is they are still trying to hire. They are still trying to hire not necessarily director level folks. They're trying to hire kind of foot soldier folks, right? Folks who could come in there and actually start to do the work. Of course, begs a whole separate question as who's going to lead and manage those people. But that's what the hiring plans are saying, right? Is that uh, the demand is still strong, the uh, appetite to address some of these new technologies is still high. And uh, so it's not doom and gloom, uh, regardless of where you are. Companies are still hiring, new developers, new talent are still being brought into the market. Um, despite all of it. Uh, you know, I think when I think about it from a government sector perspective, there are challenges, right? There's the sort of regular challenges around that everybody is facing. Like one of the things that strikes me is if you look at the history of technology, the big changes have tended to come in waves kind of one at a time, right? So there was the first wave of kind of, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, supercomputer, big box computer wave, and then there was a PC wave, and then there was a networking wave, and then there was a virtualization wave, and then, that, and then there was a containerization wave. And so there was kind of a big thing that people would always be chasing. But just in the past couple of years, it feels like there's multiple big things trying to happen simultaneously, right? So there's still a huge amount of cloud stuff needing to happen, just a massive, massive amount of legacy apps out there that nobody has touched yet because they're just fine right now. So I really can't work with it. Plus, it's certainly not sexy to go ask for money to refactor my old apps when there's all this new stuff that I need to get to. Uh, but there is kind of this old app problem kind of sitting there. Uh, but at the same time, I'm trying to figure out how am I going to you know, what's my cyber security strategy gonna look like? How am I gonna you know, get more cloud native type talent into my organization? Who's gonna go start playing with the generative AI models to figure out what, if anything, we should be doing with them? So the challenge on all organizations, not just government organizations, is pretty intense because there's multiple fronts on which you're, you know, somebody up the food chain is probably looking at you saying, what are you doing? Have you staffed up? Do you have a proof of concept? And you're thinking, mm, well, first I need people that actually know this stuff. And so okay, how would I even begin to do that in a world where you know, the last line says kind of budgets are, are already, if anything, more constrained than they were a year ago? Um, and I've got all these legacy systems. And if I raise my hand and say I need $10 million to refactor the legacy systems, I'm probably going to get laughed out of the room because nobody want to spend money on that right now. Uh, now, the ticking time bomb there is there are a lot of organizations with perfectly functional legacy monolithic systems that every year that goes by, there's fewer and fewer people in the organization that actually know how to run the thing. Uh, I, was, uh, I had an airline client in the late 90s, early 2000s. I'd be on their campus, and every now and again, I'd see this guy pushing like a cart this high. I've seen kind of pushing this cart, kind of looked like a, it wasn't food, but you could tell there was some kind of equipment on it. But it was always different places. And then I finally asked somebody, I said, 
Do you guys know that it looks like a guy that pushes this cart around? I wonder if he's homeless, maybe? They're like, oh, that's Ben. Oh, so you know who it is. So, yeah, Ben is the guy that knows how to load the tapes that we use because we're still using our scheduling system from the 60s, and it's this like tape reel based system. And so, network operations who plans where the airline's going to fly mocks up what they, want to, what they want the schedule to look like. And then Ben takes those tapes and he rolls them over to tech ops. And then the maintenance guys say, nope, this won't work because that plane has to be out of service for a heavy C you know, uh, um, uh, checkup. And then he rolls it over to flight ops and then he, I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is how you guys are scheduling this airline with like literal like tapes from the 80s. And it was another two years before they spent tens of millions of dollars to completely uh, update that system. And this is not that long ago, right? Leg these legacy systems are incredibly sticky, but they're insanely risky. Like, I honestly don't think that, Ben was like 70 years old too. I, <laughs> there's a lot of risk in legacy systems tied to people who have very specialized skill sets uh, and languages that maybe aren't well supported or known. So there's definitely some serious challenges, not just with the new technology, but with how do we get the old technology sort of ported um, into something look, that looks like modern infrastructure. Because I think if you, uh, if you went around college campuses and tried to get people excited about the prospect of working on your uh, Fortran code from the 70s, you might find it difficult to do so. Uh, so what are the opportunities, right? <laughs> you, you look at our prior slide, you think, well, okay, that does not look promising, right? We have tight budgets, we have lots of install-based stuff, and we have a whole bunch of different technologies that we need to um, try to figure out how we're going to address. Uh, so what are the ways sort of out of this conundrum? And uh, as, as you all you know, you know, probably no first hand, just trying to hire on the open market is never going to be sufficient to get you what you need. Um, has anybody in here had run into the challenge of people laughing at the top of your salary scale when you say, if you can't get me onto the is it SEC schedule where you can go off, they're like, nope, if you can't get me on that, that GS schedule is laughable. There's only so many degrees of freedom, right? If you're trying to get existing talent, when they look at the, that GS schedule, they think, maybe 10 years ago you could have got me, but there's no way that I'm coming to do this. Like, I might be as patriotic as the next person, but it's just, it just, you know, there's a real structural problem with uh, parity, right? And, and what constraints you all operate under versus what, you know, private sector companies that, you know, maybe if they don't have as much cash, they can throw some stock options and they can kind of try to put something together that seems um, appealing enough, right, to get folks in. But there's a real serious constraint around that, which pro probably means that you're not going to just go between hiring recruiters and try to fill this. So what strategies can you use to get talent in? Uh, I gave a presentation yesterday with Jay White from Microsoft. And uh, Jay told the story in there that he... Uh, enlisted in the Army and served three tours. And after his second enlistment, they put him into an IT training program because he got hurt in the desert. And it turns out he had a real aptitude for it. And so he ended up doing a whole bunch of networking, first-generation wireless networking stuff from the Army. They actually paid for him to go get trained on it. Uh, and then eventually, uh, when he hit his 20 years and got his retirement, he came out, and now he's at Microsoft doing um, secure supply chain um, stuff for them. But they got six years of great IT work out of Jay, who was an enlisted member with no college degree in this stuff until they began to invest in him. Uh, I would argue if you could find somebody and get a couple of tours out of them, if on the military side, or somebody out of college coming into, into a government department, you're probably not going to keep them forever because the siren song of private sector wages is probably going to crash the door at some point. But if you can get four or five good years out of them as they start their career, that's a win. You know, might they then refer other younger people as a way, you know, coming in to get started? You know, that's also a win. But you've got to be able to find non-traditional 
pools of talent and get ways to kind of get them in the door. Uh, Cross-training, upskilling existing folks. Uh, I mean, that's essentially what happened with Jay, right? He was you know, a regular guy, just through basic training, doing his thing, and somebody realized that he had this talent and kind of pulled him off and put him on that uh, technology training track. Who in your organization has aptitude that you could probably put onto some sort of training program? The remarkable thing about training in tech is it is orders of magnitude cheaper than even hiring a recruiter, right? You're talking about $1,000 versus $25,000. I tell people all the time, I train 20 people, even if two of them are good, you're still better off than you would be paying one recruiter to hire one person that probably leaves a few months later. You know, aggressively investing in trying to build out some talent from people who are already in your pool, I I would suggest it's probably the most cost effective and the highest yield thing that you can do because trying to get somebody from the private sector into the government sector is hard at the best of times. You start thinking about salary differences, you know, the whole just, the scale just gets higher and higher, right? As to what can you realistically do? Um, do you have degrees of freedom to hire people remotely? I think one of the things that came out of COVID Definitely in the private sector is a lot of people who yelled and screamed that remote work was not possible and the whole organization was gonna collapse and it was gonna be disastrous. In fact, found that people are you know, hardworking and honest and you can in fact have a, a non-traditional workforce in terms of location. Uh, I, and I know different parts of the government have different restrictions so you can't always do that, but if, to the extent that you're able to find folks to be able to work off-site, it's like just a, a great way to fish into a different pool. Uh, sorry, question? So, so you mentioned that the, the report that's on the, linked on the sheet that's on our, our seats. Um, what I've seen is, is a lot of, of data that looks like surveys of managers or senior leaders or something that, that says, hey, do you feel like your people were as productive doing remote work? Um, the messaging we're getting inside the, the US government largely looks like, hey, we need to get back to the level of productivity we had before. So because in order to get back to where we used to be in terms of being awesome, we're going to come back into the office. Um, do you guys have data or you, do you know anyone that has data to actually support the remote work case in different situations? Because like, we need, if we're gonna go fight those battles in the government, we really need that, that data. Yeah, that's a fair question. I don't know that we have, we didn't address that particular point in the data. Uh, what we have observed uh, in the tech industry is, uh, depends on how you try to measure productivity. Um, but certainly folks have been able to be super productive. You know, you see people working nights and weekends, logging on early, working non-traditional type hours. Uh, if you look at the sort of top level data stats of sort of Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, there is some variability in terms of what gets reported. Uh, it's hard to tease out the real number because a lot of companies cut back on hours during COVID because of the level of, of, of uncertainty. And so trying to, Trying to get to, productivity is hard to measure at the best of times. Trying to measure productivity's effects through a pandemic where significant slowdown in the economy, significant slowdown in hours work is really difficult. So I don't know that it's ever gonna be a great piece of research that says, aha, here it is, people are in fact more productive. Uh, I think if you look anecdotally at our people who started working remotely, allowing, allowing them to continue to remote, uh, work remotely, are they continuing to hire remotely where they previously didn't use to hire remotely? I think those signals are pretty strong that say that there has been a change of mindset in some places, not everywhere. There are some, famously in the news, some big tech companies that are trying to push people back into the office. Uh, and I suspect the cynic in me says that part of that is this is a backdoor way of reducing uh, labor costs because they're trying to nudge people out who don't want to come in. Uh, and who already live in high cost locations, um, because then I, you know, if you choose to quit, then I don't owe you a severance package, because uh, it's just not logical, right? It's just when, when you've had organizations that have thrived for two years and the tech sector above all thrived during COVID, uh, to then turn around and suddenly say this doesn't work after we just came off the best two years in our history doesn't ring true to me. 
Um, and I, you know, I would say certainly for the Linux Foundation, we've never had an office, right? And so we've always been 100% remote and it's always been, I found it as somebody who came from an office environment to a fully virtual environment that it's insanely more productive. I don't have to spend two hours a day getting ready, driving, parking, you know, foraging around for lunch and then coming back. Like I just get on and kind of get my stuff done. Um, but I hear your point. It is challenging because people want proof. It's like, well, I don't know how I can get you proof. There's so much noise. And how do I get the signal in that data that says definitively one way or not? And likely what's going to happen is it's sort of like if they're looking for a reason not to do it, they'll hide behind that as a reason not to do it. Uh, if they're looking across the economy and saying, hey, what changed as a result of COVID? Yeah. I live in Austin, Texas, and I can tell you just based on the amount of traffic on the road that people are not back in the office at anything like pre-COVID because I will now meet my wife downtown for dinner, which I previously was like, why don't you drive up here? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we do it because I ain't coming down there. Um, some of you may have seen this chart. The, uh, forget who it was, published some research about three weeks ago, and it was the percentage of cell phones active in the downtowns of major U.S. cities today versus pre-pandemic. In San Francisco, it's 34%. In New York, it's 47%. In Austin, it's 48%. You talk about data, to me, that's compelling data. They're not downtown, they're somewhere else. These companies didn't build offices in the suburbs. That must mean people are working from home. So I think there is some, there's, there's data that strongly suggests that work from home, maybe not every single day of the week. Um, and the joke in Austin is that Tuesday is a new Monday because nobody goes in. So Tuesday and Thursday are now the bad traffic days. So, you know, uh, but certainly some level of, of um, com combined, um, not every day in the office uh, seems to have, to have become the new normal. Um, first hand observation of what's happening in Austin, which is a fairly big tech city. All right, um, let's see, I had some other slides there. I did want to talk about this um, in terms of the hiring managers and kind of the, you know, we talked at, you know, mostly we're talking kind of higher level sort of trends. Um, you know, there are challenges down kind of in the, at the individual job level of how am I going to get somebody interested in potentially applying for this job? How am I going to, okay, how am I going to retain them? Um, how am I going to get them and have them not quit after they've been in for you know, some fairly short period of time? Uh, you know, one of the cynical approaches that used to happen in past economic down cycles is that people take jobs in perceived safe industries when there's uncertainty with the expectation that uh, once things get better over there, you know, I'll see you. So there's, that, that there's, there's definitely this sort of job security seems a lot sexier right this minute than it did a year ago. And, you know, my wife's a university professor, right? Universities are getting a lot of applications. You know, I, you know, I, this might be true in some areas of, of the government service as well, that people say, oh, that stable employer, probably not gonna lay off for a while. Uh, I would say that's an opportunity. Get them in the door and then hang on to them as tight as you can, right? If you're in a window now where they're more willing than they were a year ago to consider this career path, even if their current thinking is, safe port in a storm, so what? <laughs> Hire them and hang on to them. Hire them and cross train them aggressively and give them new skills and getting them working on cool technology that they probably wouldn't be able to get if they kind of stayed across in the private sector. But you know, don't, don't uh, yeah. feet here not bug, right? <laughs> so anything that gets them to want to come take a look at your job openings, I would say you should celebrate it because Lord knows it's hard enough getting folks to come consider a career uh, you know, a few years ago, we were at uh, KubeCon, which is a sort of cloud native conference in, so right before the pandemic in um, San Diego. And there was a really, really well attended session by a senior uh, person from the Air Force who had gotten this really cool, like semi Hollywood level video done of how they had retrofitted an F-18 fighter to run on Kubernetes, um, which is hard to do because all this stuff is deeply proprietary software that's been baked in by the military um, supplier companies. So they've taken this one F-18, 
completely retrofitted it and had done sort of a Top Gun style video of taking this thing and actually flying it. And uh, I asked him afterwards, I was like, it seems like a lot of money to spend on this sort of very slick promo type video. And he's like, listen, this is my only shot to make this job seem sexy in this audience of people who are like startup and you know Facebook meta bound is I figured let's bring the house. Let's, how cool is it to work on fighter jets? And that's gonna be our best chance ever at getting somebody to come at least <laughs> apply for the jobs we had. And I saw him about six months later and he was pleasantly surprised. He didn't get thousands of applications, but he got dozens of applications, which is better than this small pathetic drip that he would normally get. Um, now that's a, you know, it's a pretty heavy lift, right? To get a conference we can slot, and, you know, I don't know how much he spent on the video, but try some very, very different things, right? <laughs> you gotta get in the consideration set, right? You gotta find some way of unlocking people's interests uh, and getting them to, to consider a career in the government sector because pay isn't gonna do it. Patriotism is probably not gonna do it. You know, tying it back to the mission and finding some way to get a hook into them. Um, you know, just experiment, right? There's probably not one single way to do this, right? It's just a matter of try, try something until something works. And uh, if all else fails, build a cool video with whatever your product is and roll out to some kind of conference and see if you can get people uh, excited about doing it. Um, but I think the important thing is just keep trying different things, right? Uh, you know, it feels like maybe a hand is tied behind your back on some of the things, and to some extent that is, you know, when it comes to pay and other factors. But there are other things you can do to get folks interested, and particularly folks who are entry level in their career. Um, the big guys don't like to hire truly entry level people because it feels risky, ain't nobody got the time for that, I can afford to pay the person 200K plus stock bonuses and just get them in and have them up and running. Um, okay, play the hand you're dealt with, right? Focus more on some of that entry level talent, go to those community colleges, go to those high schools that have alternative curriculums and just try to find those folks and get them in the door. Training is so much cheaper than experience. Right? It is way, way, way cheaper to train somebody on these technologies than it is to buy experience when people already have it. Order of magnitude difference. I have a question, again, follow up on, on, on this uh, uh, paper that we got on your seats. Um, does this numbers, does the report has anything specific to government sector or is more very broad in the all industries? Uh, I don't believe there was a separate cutout. There weren't enough respondents on the government sector. So there, there is a section that goes industry by industry when there was statistically enough responses from the sector to be able to line it out. But if memory serves, we didn't get enough from government to carve it out. We had a few, but not enough to be statistically significant, so it doesn't show up. The, the stats guys go through and kind of cut the line on kind of what you could, and if it's only five or six, it's not robust enough to show. And there, because I know there's financial services, there's telecom, there's healthcare, um, but we, it wasn't the question set, but they didn't, there weren't enough responses to, to have a, a, va a valid response really to pu publish a separate line item on it. I would suspect, yeah. For those of you in the service, I suspect you can read the data and sort of interpolate as to where you think the, <laughs> the data lines up, right? So somewhere south of healthcare is uh, when you think of sort of how attractive a tech career is in different, in different verticals. All right, I think I only have maybe one more slide. Um, and this is kind of back to some of what we talked about. Uh, upscaling, upscaling, upscaling. I'm just like a broken record on this because it's so much cheaper than trying to hire talent and you can find it everywhere. There's, you know, we have stuff, your community college locally probably has stuff. You know, I think the one challenge that is more of a change management and cultural challenge that um, you need to really be mindful of. When you go down the path of an upscaling or non-traditional hiring, there, it does place an additional burden on your organization, which is your existing folks have to commit to doing more mentoring. Right, the one upside of hiring qualified people is they walk in the door and they ought to, if you did your interviews right, have the basic skills that they need um, to sort of be kind of basic professional competence. And you still have to train them on using the systems and all that, right? But when you take, when you're upskilling up somebody from a different role or when you take somebody from a non-traditional hire, 
there has to be a collective commitment to mentoring because building up a skill set like that is not two weeks of onboarding for a new hire. Right? This is a multi-month, probably six to nine, maybe 12 month commitment to sort of gradually helping this person. Are you assigning somebody to be a mentor? Do you have a, some kind of program that says, hey, let's check in weekly? Just training people is not enough, right? You have to make them successful. The ask of your organizations, if you're gonna do that, is assign mentors to these folks. Have somebody to, to just, not just learn the ropes, but somebody to just give them the feedback on, mm, no, nah, that's not how you set up that service. It's gonna end in tears. Uh, they need somebody holding their hand. Make you know. Remember, folks who are not c coming in with experience, they, as a general rule, are going to have confidence issues about their ability to do this job. Your job is to help them not get hung up on that, right? And so, if really, uh, it's a very new thing to have to ask your engineers and developers to explicitly put time towards mentorship. But if you're going to have to use non-traditional hires and upskilling, that's going to be the one ask of you. It's cheap, it's available to you because you can go fish in pools that other people aren't fishing in, but you as an organization are going to have to find ways to be aggressive in mentoring these folks. Telling them when they're doing great, telling them when they're not doing great, hopefully quietly, privately, um, but encourage them, right? Encourage them. Everybody in tech at some point kind of has that aha moment where they suddenly feel like they get it. It's not day one, it's certainly not day one if you're a newbie, right? So try to make sure that you provide a supportive environment for these folks as they're going through it. You know for sure they're gonna make mistakes, you know for sure they're gonna have one or more crises of confidence. You know, make sure your organization is prepared to realize that and you know, have support mechanisms because you're way better off if you can get those people through the crisis of confidence and productive uh, than you'd be in the alternative where you're back to trying to hire an experienced person from the outside. So, and that's a big commitment that most people maybe don't see coming is, yeah, it's not just training. Right? Training's critical, they have to get the skills, it's also that mentorship environment that you've got to put people into. Right. I have some other slides, I don't really think we need to go through them, I've kind of, talked a lot and covered most of what I wanted to say. Right, any questions, comments, observations from you guys? All right, we'll take up and check it. Yeah, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, so e even in the private sector, you tend to have these problems uh, with recruiting where you know, you're not Google, Meta, or et cetera. Um, and you, a lot of time, compensation is a way to do that. But also, uh, th with these training programs specifically, I think we've had success where by getting people from these diverse backgrounds and non-traditional backgrounds and putting in the effort to actually train them, like a six, eight week training, um, before they even join a team, uh, is that you first of all build a certain level of, of um, competency in those people. Uh, so that they're ready to get started out the door so you avoid the crisis of confidence. And secondly, uh, you once they're upskilled, right, they provide a diverse sort of set of thinking that a traditional, C if you have a 100 traditional CS majors, often having 50 traditional CS majors and 50 non-traditional, you come up with wildly better solutions, more creative and more well thought out, um, and foster a culture that will encourage your employees to stay. Um, so we found that that is probably the secret sauce. I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, it's on the same lines, not a question, but more of a, maybe a comment that that's one thing that we have done. We have had a lot of success on um, talking to students, participating on co-ops uh, projects and um, school projects like university. Um, and also not necessarily more of a formal training, maybe a, um, even IT and tech schools that provide diploma certificates. We, we've had a lot of success as well from those. We've had people who came in. Um, a few of them have left, but I think they provide enough service for about five years and then they gained some skills and went away. We got some more and, and I think that that was fine. And we've also had success with people who, who got some even open, 
working on open source is a way for them to to attract them on building their resume, their career path, and and then that I've discovered that you know government is not as bad as it sounds, <laughs> and and that I'm staying for far longer. <laughs> People will stay, right? People will stay if they enjoy the work and they're getting to push and learn and, and drive new skills. Uh, that's not to say they might stay forever and at some point, you know, the mortgage plus the new kid on the way and he might decide, okay, I, you know, <laughs> gotta go where there's some more green to be had, but you know, uh, you know, the not being fatalistic about it. Get them in and, and try, you know, and you know what? They may move on and they may have a younger cousin, friend, neighbor that they then sort of clue on to the same track. Um, there's a lot, when you get into these non-traditional networks, you get a lot of referral effects that you don't necessarily get when you're on a college campus and people have 10 offers because it's like finding magic, right? It's like, oh my God, I found a way in and the people are supportive and friendly and you know, it, it, it tends to be very self, um, reinforcing if you can get into some of these non-traditional um, talent pools. Because you're not competing with, like, you know, there's not 10 companies in there, you know, trying to figure out uh, how you can identify skilled people. It's probably just you. Yeah, it's a mission as well, the tech company layoffs, but not specifically to that. I've also seen people went away and then they come back a few years later. <laughs> so, so they might have some other career goals that they want to develop or ha get gain more experience, but some of them also come back later on in a more leadership role. Um, and that, that has, I've seen that happen as well. So. Yeah, those are great oh, folks. If, if, you can, if you can get them on their second way across, right? To, to, uh, cause career gaps are hard to explain, right? Career gaps kind of spook some employers. And so you might, you might have a better shot of somebody coming back, you know, they, took time off with a sick parent or had a new baby or whatever, right? But um, fish where the fish are, man. Don't fish, don't fish where the other people are fishing. <laughs> fish where the fish are because you know, if you are not a startup or a big Fortune 2000 company, you know, you know that you're at a competitive disadvantage in trying, to, in the, trying to access some of this talent. So you gotta use different strategies to make it happen. Last call for questions? Either that or lunch. All right, thank you all for being here, appreciate it.